quickly. So maybe the next slide, Raiko. Yeah, so <laughs> here are our speakers for today. That's uh, Raiko. He's a colleague of mine working as a solution engineer in Germany too. We have Alas, he's a principal technical account manager working with large customers and does also a lot of presentations and help, for example, to do our uh, quick vMotion for really big and large VMs. And we have uh, Vagis, he's based in Dubai, also a technical account manager working with large customers. You see where are they specialized and so on within the fields and all their Twitter, Twitter accounts. So next slide. So what we, um, I just want to quickly give you an overview um, what you will see today or, or, or parts of what you will see today. Maybe, maybe you all have seen this one here. That's our, we call it Ember Vision a few years ago, but that's no more vision. That's really now um, the, the state of the art currently. So what we are want to do is that, that you can run any, any device can can work with any application on any cloud uh, and to, with uh, intrinsic based security so that with our solution you are able to build run manage connect and protect to due to our new security business units yeah any application any app uh, any cloud and any device more or less and we will dive deeper uh, into a lot of these parts uh, during the whole presentation Okay, then back uh, to you, Raiko. Perfect. Thank you, Sebastian. And uh, as you were talking about uh, applications on the platform, right? Um, we need to, to clarify uh, what's this Tanzu thing, right? I mean, uh, as you may know, we, we're talking here from experts to experts. Maybe you've heard of our realized products um, and uh, the realized products from VMware are really these these management constructs. Uh, so we got our operations tool, we got our orchestrator, all are in the realize family. And due to the fact that containerized applications, microservices um, become so popular, um, VMware decided, so we decided to, to have a, a own an own brand for all things cloud native. And this is what Tanzu really is all about. And if you are asking yourself, hey, okay, I know VMware for, um, for, uh, for VDI, for application delivery, for virtualization, and now you wanna tell me you, are, uh, you can speak honestly about uh, Kubernetes and, and microservices, um, why is this? And um, I've chosen, before, before we start into the, the architecture of our solution, I've chosen to, to use this slide to, to really tell you folks um, why VMware and Kubernetes is, is such a great fit together. And um, yeah, let's jump jump right into it. I mean, um, I think two two years ago, VMware um, bought uh, the the company called Heptio. Heptio is was a company um, with with the Kubernetes founders, right? So they went from Google, uh, they created Heptio, Craig McLucky, Joe Bida, and uh, they really focused on um, making Kubernetes um, tangible for large enterprises. So getting Kubernetes in production. And um, this was a strategic buy for VMware to, to have all these, uh, these Kubernetes um, in the company um, driving the product direction uh, forward. And um, with Heptio, then we, uh, we decided to, to buy Bitnami, Bitnami as a, um, as a company delivering and packaging uh, applications to multiple kind of um, um, platforms like AWS or Kubernetes, uh, you maybe know. No cube apps. Um, uh, we got a, uh, a commercial offering called uh, Tensor Application Catalog here, and um, yeah, finally, uh, finally, Pivotal. P Pivotal is back in the house, and Pivotal, very famous for for Spring and all the um, all the Cloud Foundry stuff. They are pioneered during the during the early days, and this is why VMware now has a really um, strong commitment regarding uh, Kubernetes, cloud native services, and Cloud native applications, and maybe maybe just a, a very funny story here. Um, I, I know we we already had some some kind of uh, Kubernetes uh, troubleshooting sessions here during uh, E2E, but uh, again, I, I found this very um, very on the point. So if you see the cat here, uh, and the question is, um, what's what's Kubernetes in its core, right? So we got the cat. The cat maybe is. Uh, 
is here the the example for the for the chaos the chaos that uh, that can happen and uh, we all love kubernetes for this uh, declarative um, approach right we define something and kubernetes uh, is in charge of um, um, spinning up new pods if something dies i found it really funny so i, I included this um, analogy in my presentation okay and how you i mean um all of us i mean everybody got uh, at least some some vsphere right in his data center uh, to 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 virtualize um and to to offer services and now i want to talk with you about the very new vsphere with tanzu and in one important point here right it is not that we make kubernetes some kind of first class citizen onto vsphere no we really re-architected the way uh, vSphere works. We we embedded Kubernetes inside of vSphere, and for sure we made containerized workloads a first-class citizen on vSphere. And uh, this is what I'm I'm showing you today. So the new from the from VMworld the new vSphere with with Tanzu thing, and uh, to give you uh, a better feeling what vSphere with Tanzu is um let's let's just look at the this slide here i mean if you look at the left we got the developers in our company the right we got um, it operation forks and when it comes to kubernetes itself um every persona or every kind of um, siloed organization inside inside your company maybe have a, a different goal when it comes to kubernetes the the left hand side develop, developer forks really want to just consume Kubernetes, um, upstream Kubernetes. They want to, to integrate their applications or their, their, um, their CICD pipeline um, into, into Kubernetes or Kubernetes into this, uh, into this pipeline where they can then just push new versions and uh, be faster and more agile. And they, if, you, if you talk to, to developers, they really don't care about Kubernetes um, itself, and especially where it is running, right? Just they just need Kubernetes. Can be public cloud, can be on premises, but it it needs to be real upstream Kubernetes to be uh, used with all the tools that they're using today, right? And if you look to the right, left hand, uh, to the right hand side, you see the IT operators, and they tend they they tend to need to to keep the ball rolling, right? They need to uh, be able to um, to to keep the lights on, to to monitor things, to keep security in place, um, and um, yeah, this is where vSphere with Stanza really shines. Um, you you got your your ESX clusters, you got uh, your networking, your storage, and uh, you can offer very easily K uh, Kubernetes as a service uh, right um, out of out of vSphere, and this is what we are looking at now. So basically, from a, from an architecture perspective, if you get a, a vSphere cluster and you got vSphere 7 um, update one, preferably, um, you can easily uh, create uh, Kubernetes clusters and make your your vSphere world more more declarative by just enabling uh, workload management. And um, every vSphere customer um, has the ability. Uh, the ability to use the built-in 60-day trial so i uh, just want to shout out give it a try and do what we are talking about here right now so first and foremost we got uh, our, our diagram here you see vcenter in the middle you see the the vi admin persona on the left and and the esxi boxes very familiar for everybody uh, who is using vSphere uh, for, for ages. Uh, we got the, the ESXi boxes, we got the host daemon who's responsible for, for starting, stopping virtual machines. And if you, if you then enable workload management, so vSphere with Tanzu, you basically create, um, uh, in, in, the, in the first place, you create your Kubernetes control plane. Uh, it is here shown with a, with a single VM, but uh, in reality, it's uh, it's a control plane uh, consisting of uh, three VMs, so uh, for viability purposes. Um, but in essence, you get this um, Kubernetes control plane that gets deployed, the Kubernetes master VMs. And on the ESXi host itself, we um, we install we install an agent um, right beside the host D process called the Spherelet, 
And the, the sphere lid is, in Kubernetes terms, uh, the, the kubelet, right, that you know from, from the worker responsible communicating back to the API server, getting uh, in charge of uh, starting and stopping um, pods on, on the given uh, worker node. And that is exactly what, what we are seeing here. So we are, enable, we, we are enabling uh, Kubernetes functionality directly on the host, uh, on the ESXi host. And that enables us to, to just start and stop native Kubernetes pods uh, right on the ESXi host. And this vSphere supervisor cluster, where we can then start and stop Kubernetes pods and offer Kubernetes as a service right, uh, right from, from vSphere, uh, can live alongside um, traditional workloads like VMs. And we are all know that um, that modern applications, for sure, microservices kind of applications uh, rely on, on containers. But um, in the end, you got so much stuff that is still sitting inside of which machines, big databases maybe, or, um, or, or other stateful stuff, not, uh, not telling you that you shouldn't uh, put um, stateful stuff not in Kubernetes. But uh, in the end, uh, it is a world where we have um, Kubernetes pods, containers, and VMs, um, and all these, um, these um, pieces build up our application. And when it comes then to the supervisor cluster itself, um, we got the ESXi hosts. Uh, for sure, we can use NSX to enrich the, the, the networking in Kubernetes with a, a container network interface um, that is used um, or that is triggering um, NSX to magically create um, load balancing services, um, L4 to L7. Um, you, have, you have your ingress, you have maybe vSAN, and you have your um, vSAN storage capabilities, but uh, that's not a must, right? Um, you can start with plain ESXi. We ship AJ proxy as your, um, as your load balancing component, and uh, you're good to go. Um, in the end, I think for me it's very important to just highlight here that from the supervisor cluster perspective that we, that we have seen earlier, you're then able to offer your clients inside your organizations um, the, the possibility that they can then spin up their own Kubernetes clusters. Um, in the end, we are using cluster API as a technology to, to spin up new Kubernetes clusters inside the, the vSphere supervisor cluster. And this is where the freedom starts, right? Uh, the freedom uh, for the developers to, to um, to create their own Kubernetes instances uh, right on the, the vSphere platform. And side by side, we still have virtual machines and we can use um, the ideas here to, to use the Kubernetes API and the declarative model to define things and let the API server handle it and take, take care of the, the placement and the, um, the creation of, of objects here. Um, this can be done then for, for, the, for the Kubernetes instances, for the ports, for the containers and for the virtual machines. And we really got rich network services here. So we got, um, when it comes uh, to, to, the, to the idea that we embed um, NSX into the solution, then um, yeah, uh, from, a, from a consumer perspective, um, every net kind of network service that you wish to have um, is then embedded in the solution. So layer four to layer seven, seven um, load balancing, you got uh, the possibility to, to fence network segments to if you wanna, if you're like in the finance industry and you wanna, uh, you wanna take care of um, micro segmentation and some kind of boundaries for the developers, then you can, can sure fence, fence this using, using NSX. Get your storage services with, with vSAN or any other storage solution that is connected to your ESXi host, where you can create storage policies and magically all these uh, persistent volume claims um, that you create in Kubernetes will create first class disks in your vSphere environment. And um, in the end, um, you get a very stable and, um, and uh, upstream conformant Kubernetes infrastructure where, where vSphere is, is taking care of all the nitty bitty gritty details to, uh, to connect all the things together, right? You got this pod VM service, you got uh, an embedded registry. So Harbor is, uh, is also a CNCF project um, that is uh, also maintained by VMware. And this is, uh, this is just embedded into vSphere, right? And then we got the, the, the whole ecosystem, the idea here to, to use operators to deploy all these kind of applications then into your Kubernetes infrastructure. 
Okay, and two more slides. This is how it looks like from the VI admin uh, interface. We got um, our love, beloved VSP client, where we then, where the IT operator, right from the from the right hand side, the operator can see all the Kubernetes details. Uh, we can see Kubernetes clusters, uh, pods, um, namespaces, and um, all the good stuff. And for the for the developer persona, um, you just present them a landing page where they can log in with the tools they want to use. And for sure, uh, you can, can can use your kubectl, kubectl tools to then log into the supervisor cluster. Um, if you look down at the screen, you can then uh, apply some YAML to create your own supervisor, pardon, uh, sorry, your, your own Kubernetes cluster. So in the end, we use uh, the, the declarative model of, of Kubernetes to create more Kubernetes inside of Kubernetes. Um, right? But um, this is really, really huge for us. And uh, I would love to, to get in touch with, with some of you. If you've got any questions, um, feel free to, to drop me a message uh, via, um, via Twitter. And um, yeah, with this, uh, I would uh, hand over to the next speaker. And I think it's, uh, it's Lars. Um, Raikos, thanks. I hope you can hear me. Um, maybe you can cover the slides. Um, so, um, as we said, uh, the Cloud Foundation is the, is, the, is, the, is the foundation of all the things we're running on one platform. And as Raiko mentioned, is the one thing is all the microservices, all the container stuff. But on the other hand, we want to provide one platform for all the things running on it and and uh, as you know there's there's the, the discussion of kettles versus pets and on the other hand we, we as vm we want to provide you a platform um, you can run um, a workload with, without um, any compromise in scale what that means is you can run all the huge vms uh, a little bit the other side of the house what Riker was talking about the um, all the microservices and all the pods and and, and decorative uh, state but we want to provide one platform, and, and as you know from the past, we, we introduced, I think it was in 2015, the vSphere 5.5 uh, monster VM called Marvin. Uh, we had a, fun, a funny uh, cartoon with that, and we said, oh, there's a one terabyte VM, and all the, the people said in 2015, okay, what I have to do with one terabyte of memory in one virtual machine? And we saw um, the growing market with um, application um, they change their architecture to run their workload in the memory, and it's it's more faster. And um, with the VMworld announcement of uh, vSphere 7.0 update one, we scale it up to 24 terabyte of memory and up to 786 vCPUs. What is a, a massive uh, improvement to the uh, previous version. Um, in, in the same case, we also um, uh, in, increase the support of PMEM, so the persistent memory. As you know from Intel, it's called Intel Persistent uh, Obtain uh, Persistent Memory. Um, some people say Apache. Um, what that means is you can combine that um, to scale your servers um, up to these 24 terabytes, maybe on an 8-socket system. Uh, what is a better uh, TCO for you? So you see, t 2015 we had the, the, the four terabyte uh, VM with 6.0 and 6.5, and then we scale and we scale up to six terabyte um, in 2019 with um, six, uh, six seven announcement. And you see now we are on 24 terabyte. So we make a huge uh, engineering invest um, to up to scale here from six terabyte to 24 terabyte. What the reason behind that is a lot of customer running their database in especially this is this SEP HANA a workload that is mostly running in a, in memory. Um, um, we get a huge amount of that um, uh, request from our customers to run it in a virtual environment. Why? They seeing also from that perspective the benefit of running this huge important application on a virtualized uh, platform. You have all the benefits uh, to do the vMotion. So we improved in 7.0, uh, what was a GA date in February this year, the vMotion process itself regarding the challenges was if we announce our hypervisor with 24 terabyte of virtual memory, we have to improve our vMotion process to move this workload from one host to the other one. 
um, that's the one thing. And uh, here you see a slide a little bit, the difference, uh, what other um, uh, vendors are providing. So we want to provide that on-premise to you. If you say, I have this huge workload, we're seeing this huge workload, this is not coming in any customers, but we're seeing that I get my first request in 2017 for 16 terabyte VMs. Um, to saying we see the demand of the business to have this data in in memory um, to get faster outputs to the business so now we have 24 terabytes of course they need a certification from SAP itself so our alliance team is working very hard on that to get this out um, first of all with a combination of uh, persistent memory regarding if you want to scale a 24 terabyte uh, host and a VM on a 24 terabyte host uh, on an eight socket system, you need uh, 250 uh, gigabytes of DIMMs, what is not possible to get in the market at the moment. So a good good choice is 128 gigabytes together with 256 uh, PMEMs from Intel. So you have a very good um, uh, TCO regarding PMEM is, is, has a good pricing uh, compared to the size. Um, but but we scale... Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I heard rumors that you can have this uh, this kind of vSphere um, even in in Azure, AWS, and and Google because because you're telling that it's uh, an on-premise world. But I heard rumors yes. this is, this is available in the cloud, right? In the cloud, and you make it here is bare metal. So what you have is a is a cloud operation model maybe, but it's bare metal. And with the bare metal, you will all have the challenges about high availability. And in the past, uh, a lot of vendors also, uh, VMA was looking to have, a, have a, a cluster system. And as you know, how complicated it is to get the in-clustering or a guest clustering application cluster, the customer love the easiest way to have vSphere HA. What, how, how many seconds you need to configure your vSphere HA compared to a, to an application cluster? I think that's the, the, the values here. So what we also change is the vSphere uh, cluster scale enhancements. So we in, in improve it uh, from 64 host to 96 hosts. So you can scale more host in one cluster if it's needed. Um, what means um, if you have a, a, po a, a policy of one fail host or two fail hosts, you can scale it for more hosts over the cluster itself. So um, we want to show the market we can scale and we do the scale and also the operations. And um, all the things doesn't make sense if you don't have a simplified operations model. The operation is all the things uh, you want to run it. And as you know, we, we introduced the vSphere lifecycle manager with the uh, 7.0. We make now some um, um, improvements of the tool itself. So what you can do is, um, for example, you can have desired states. You can check uh, uh, where, where you are, uh, you can do also now NSXT, our uh, software-defined networking uh, solution to install it, patching, um, etc. Et and with the support of Lenovo, we also integrate their tools and their um, uh, firmware and driver updates. As, as we, we're saying, we always in a virtual world, we can move a VM to one host to the other host. But end of the day, we have to take maintenance on the hypervisor itself and the underlying hardware. And always the customer has the challenge, okay, I have two boots and I have two tools and I have to check this and this. We want to simplify that. Of course, VM is not a, a hardware vendor. We will never ship hardware and uh, we will not writing uh, firmwares and, and drivers for this hardware, but we have to provide the customers one solution. And this includes also the maintenance of the hardware itself. And this is the reason why we in integrated here the Lenovo stuff uh, as a first vendor, and other vendors, of course, will come in, um, integrate to patch, for example, your firmwares of your SSDs if you're running your vSAN in this um, HCI model, for example. Yeah? So it, it makes sense to simplify that. Of course, this has a support from the different uh, hardware vendors. Um, in this case, we have it. So it makes sense to integrate this uh, uh, lifecycle manager with the hardware itself. Yes, um, so, and what we also uh, integrate is the vCenter Connect. As Haraiku mentioned, there is a lot of cloud providers and we're working all with the cloud providers together to, to build uh, uh, our solution on there based on, on VCF. It doesn't matter if you go to IBM Cloud, if you go to uh, VMware um, uh, um, Cloud on AWS, or you go to Azure 
VMware solution, all their running uh, VMware Cloud Foundation as the foundation. And what the challenge is, is of course, you have a workload here, you have a workload here, and you have a workload here, and you have a vCenter here, you have a vCenter here, you have a vCenter here. And end of the day, what is the discussion? Oh, which way center I have to log in and blah, blah. We want to have you a one single pane of glass and we introduce the any to any vCenter connect. What means if you have a running your on-premise workload managed by vCenter or you have run it in a cloud, for example, with um, AWS or Azure or Google, plus you have maybe a workload on, a, on one of our 4,000 cloud certified uh, cloud providers and you can connect all these things together to have one single pane of glass to have one management, you can exchange your tags, uh, you can move workload from one um, uh, cloud to the other one uh, if, if your network is, is, is configured for that. But you have a single pane of management tool um, to, to use this. Uh, so it makes sense to give the customer one single tool as we you know we have too many tools. We have to simplify it. And it's also the challenge of VMware and we accepted this challenge. With that, I want to uh, hand over to Vagis. And I just uh, make Vagis the presenter here. Right click, make presenter. This works fine. Okay. And then I uh, So, Vagis, are you able to share now? Yep. Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Just white letters on what? Yeah, now it's coming. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, should we look for some questions before I start with my my session? Okay. So. Uh, let me start with like uh, what I will be th uh, thanks to Reiko and Klaus for going through all all the all the new stuff, all of those things. And what I am going to take you through is a bit on what's new with vSphere 7 update one, and also a bit on the vSAN 7 update one, uh, continuing with what Lars had been mentioning, right? So I'll start with vSphere BitFusion. BitFusion, as you know, like is basically uh, was a game changer for GPU virtualization. As you all know, like ML workloads have a lot, lot of parallel maths and GPUs have a lot of parallel computation and hence the GPU accelerate uh, ML application hundreds of time. But then the all the issue what we have started facing with GPU, uh, GPU was basically a lot of GPU resources are being bought by the customers, but then those are not being very widely used or very wisely used, I can say. So that resulted in a lot of uh, wastage of resources as well as heavy. Uh, it was not really cost efficient. So that's where we, uh, with our uh, acquisition of BitFusion uh, one, one and a half years back, we have now released on with the vSphere with BitFusion. So the the, 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 as I mentioned, the common challenges with GPU was basically underutilized uh, AI servers and then a lot of resources which are, are being idle and then heavy, heavily uh, sized servers being given to the each and every user which are not being used, right? So that's where with BitFusion, we were able to virtualize that and then deliver it across the network. So we pooled the, we pooled the entire GPUs. We were able to pool the entire GPUs and then virtualize it and then give it to the uh, endpoints or users, whichever be it, be it the IoT device or be it any ML AI workloads or whatever be that, we, we were able to virtualize it and then share it across. So this helped in uh, wisely or uh, optimally utilizing the resources and then that's that was basically like uh, the best cost cost effective solution as well as like best utilization of the resources as well and what i what i would i would see the best one of the best key things which came out of us was a common management by vcenter as well because it gets integrated directly to the vsphere part as well right so not just with virtualizing the gpus but also the ml workloads ml workloads it, 
as you as you know it it is completely unpredictable the kind of utilization and usage it needs from each of these users are completely different right so that's that's again bitfusion uh, gives a better a bigger advantage of not just virtualizing but also like slicing it as an as and how it needs for each and every user user resources right so that's that's again the new non uniform slicing was one of the key things which we announced along with seven update one db sphere with third thing and then the most important thing what i i see here in seven update one is basically direct integration into the vcenter so this is the vcenter vsphere client wherein you can basically just just see see how it it has got integrated into the gpu part as well in the vsphere client itself right so that that is with the vsphere bitfusion another another key capability which i want to talk about is uh, this is the first release of this uh, feature called vSphere clustering services. Okay, let's see what it is, right? So, uh, so in our seven update one, vSphere up, seven update one, we introduced this uh, vSphere cluster services. So, you you see all those uh, features, uh, cluster level features of high availability, DRS, DPM, all of those things. These are managed at vCenter level, right? So. So most of these features, if the vCenter is not available, either it it, will, it won't be functional or we won't be able to manage anything on that, right? So that that made it a point that vCenter became a, a point of failure. Like if vCenter fails, each of these features, DRS, HA, DPM will have either not working or will have an impact. So that's where we were thinking about like moving it into a completely different um, management plane or clustering plane a control plane within the vSphere cluster itself so taking it out from vCenter server into the v into the vSphere cluster level <coughs> sorry so which means we will have uh, once this is enabled once vCLS is enabled so it it, it installs like three small for, footprint agent VMs and these are like really very small like one 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 gigahertz cpu 2 gb ram and 2 gb hard disk space and you don't need to manage these vm these are like completely uh, as part of the vsphere cluster solution it comes in as uh, once you enable this and this forms the uh, what you call the quorum the which, which will manage which will control the drs drs features as of now in seven update one we, we are beginning with drs Probably in the upcoming releases, it, you will see it more going it in for HA as well as DPM itself. So this definitely means your uh, vCenter is no more that point of failure wherein you uh, your DRS or uh, HA can be uh, impacted as well, right? So that is that is one thing which we have come out in seven update one, and you will see more and more uh, updates on this coming in in the future releases so that more features gets integrated into this. Okay, so going further forward, uh, the next release for next feature which I want to talk about is the enhance vMotion capability for graphics, right? So what what does that mean, right? So uh, this was introduced in seven update one again. EBC for graphics allows graphic mode enabled VMs to seamlessly consume a consistent set of features across varied graphic vendors and software vendors, right? So it uh, along with the it, it is it is just an extension of enhanced vMotion capability so you can vMotion the vm between uh, non non uniform or non compatible hardware so that can be that feature is being added into even the graphic enabled vms as well so now uh, so this would mean that like you can enable evc for graphics per vm and then vCenter ensures that the EVC for graphics enabled VMs are powered on on the host that can provide the required graphic capabilities. So currently, initial support is for uh, for a single graphics mod called Baseline, and it corresponds to the Direct 3D 10.1 and OpenGL 3.3 specifications. Moving further forward, going into a a more uh, a security related feature which has been announced so two years back we announced along with amd uh, compatibility with the with the the amd's epic processor which was giving up coming up with a feature called secure uh, encrypted virtualization okay so let's see what what does that mean right so if you if you look at the uh, if you look at uh, the this virtualization security 
we all know like you don't need more kind of security it is all already secure right within the operating within the guest operating system you have its own process protection and permission models then you have the vm runtime vm runtime which or vmx is a form of isolation by itself right it's a process which runs inside the guest uh, in the esxi that runs in the runs the guest vm now around the uh, vm runtime we form the sandbox a hardware layer for protection separating the guest and the rest of the hypervisor so these are all separations between workloads on the same host uh, apart from that we have like on the different hosts we have definitely the separation right so now all these are in the software so you need to have physical segregation or all these have to be trusted there should there still require a level of trust in cpu memory controllers pc bus controllers and like like so also vms also should require a level of trust in the hypervisor too so that's where the amd secure processor comes into picture right so where the acv or secure uh, uh, encrypted virtualization is there a guest os which supports the scv or it can actually request the actual processor for a, a encryption key and enable the full encrypted mode all over the place right so within that vm so that will communicate directly with the processor of the cpu or on the amd processor which has this uh scv enable it will communicate directly with encrypted mode so that means you you th there is no a uh, mode of uh, secure in insecure communication happening in between the vms or even with the within the hardware itself right so that makes it more secure why is this more important now is because all the vulnerabilities recently what you have seen are talking about these kind of uh, uh, secu insecure communication the vms hosting on the same vm sharing the memory with uh, cpu threads and also that is definitely not an easy way of uh, 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 vulnerable easy easy case of vulnerable but then definitely this these kind of uh, secure processors and all can definitely stop those even those things into coming into picture right so this is a cv cs and then definitely the, there is a trade-off to that right so you, you're talking about highly securing all of those things but then uh, there are as of now there are like few consideration which need to come into picture which is uh, you need to have the amd epic generation 2 cpus which supports scv and then the guest guest toys guest toys also need to specifically support this and then you will uh, have to give away with the features of other features like v motion memory snapshot hot ads uh, suspension all of those features will not be available once we enable all of those things right so but then the benefits of course you you get to have more secure environment when, especially in the environments where the financial environment where you are talking about going away with all the vulnerabilities making all remediation or all these these becomes very these become, will become very important and then yeah so this is this is how the next generation of uh, the hardware assisted virtualization or hardware assisted encrypted model is coming up in the picture and currently it is amd scv which is in the picture okay so going further forward uh, another feature for securing the uh, the whole in, uh, hypervisor layer is basically the vsphere trust authority so in uh, in 6.7 in 6.7 we uh, came out with uh, something called attestation. So what does that mean is like uh, when, when, when a ESXi host boots up, uh, it can actually uh, uh, report report the metrics, the boot metrics, the boot process and configuration and to the vCenter server. And then vCenter server can validate it with the baseline, baseline which is being created. This is what we call attestation. Now, what happened is vCenter itself is a VM running on the vSphere cluster. Right, one of the hosts is uh, hosting this vCenter server. So you cannot definitely uh, encrypt vCenter at that point of time because we are, we are, it is running, it is, it is a VM running on that same host itself, right? So also when you, when, when the, when the vSphere boots up and then it, if the vCenter finds there is a, a malware or it, there is a functionality uh, beyond that or not matching the baseline, it can just alert. It cannot stop it from booting. That was that was a thing, right? So that's where we came out with something called uh, a VTA host or vSphere Trust Authority host, which is basically we take 
we take three hosts outside these are completely outside the cluster and then that will take care of the attestation so which means vcenter is no way involved you know no more involved into this and we can even encrypt vm vcenter as well so this is this we came out in 7.0 and then we have uh, further enhanced it with a lot of uh, improvements in the ui itself for making it easy easily configurable and accessible better day to operation and also reporting and alerting because that was one of the feedback which came in like we we talk about all these uh, we uh, trust trust authority manageability at all but then it needs quite a lot of reporting because what comes in which one of it is like uh, uh, could there could be false positive in those, those cases that's where the reporting and alerting became very very important and we have taken care of that in seven update one there had been a major improvement on that now talking about the feedback so now uh, in, this is a very simple feature but then had been uh, helping a lot of customers making it easy for them to provide your feedback be it good or be it bad right so uh, in vsphere client you will see a small smiley icon on the right hand top corner where you can click on that and then it pops up the f uh, page for sending feedback so feedback could be something which you want to uh, praise us or appreciate us or you can uh, report as a problem or if you have an idea to make the user and user usability better right so that also you can add in there take a screenshot upload an image if you want and then do on to that so this directly goes into our vc ideas portal and this is this is what we will take it from there right now some updates i want to mention on from vsphere 7 i have done it in the last session i need to be here also but then this is important as i mentioned here when talking about 7 update one as well most important thing the vcenter 7 uh, the architecture right so just before 7 uh, till 7 6.7 we used to have an external platform services control controller which was a need for enabling enhanced link mode which is basically having one single uh, portal wherein one single page where you can get to see all the all the vcenters in one single page right so that needed uh, enhanced link mode needed external PSC. Now that has been taken off. Now everything is embedded into one single vCenter appliance. So the PSC comes into vCenter appliance and whatever you need it. Like so earlier when you want to have v PSC, you take out the PSC for enhanced link mode, but then PSC being a single point of failure, you want to have uh, PSC in a high availability mode, which means you have two PSCs and then add an external load balancer. That was adding complexity to whole architecture and then deployment, right? So that's where we have gone away with that. Everything is embedded back into the vCenter server appliance, PSC, vSphere, everything, all the services are at one single appliance. So it makes it easy for uh, availability, makes it easy for backup, makes it easy for upgrade, all of those things. So it's so simple now uh, still enhanced link mode works with uh, embedded psc itself so that is that that is a major major change that what that i i would see in that now one point which i don't want to miss in mentioning even in seven update one is basically the change in the drs so distributed resolve scheduling you all know what it used to do was basically like uh, make sure that the the, the vms are are uh, distributed within the cluster equally on all the hosts so what was it looking for it was looking for it was a cluster centric mechanism wherein it was looking at the host utilization so if a host has a high utilization it will move off cpu or memory it will move the vms from that host to another host within the cluster which has a lesser utilization this was how you it used to work but then we over the period of time we found that like that that should not be the right way of drs right it should be we are not we are not we are not really looking at the host utilize we should be really looking at the vm performance how vm is performing how vm is capable of performing right so what that's what we call vm happiness so now the new drs which has come out in 7.0 is all workload centric which is vm centric it doesn't look at the uh, the host utilization but then it looks at a vm and specific metrics like uh, cpu contention memory contention and all and based on that it will uh, identify where it should move it doesn't even look at it no more looks at the host utilization but then look as it looks at this specific metrics within the vm so accordingly it moves uh, the vm 
so that it places the vm in a hose where the vm can be more happy for executing so that's that's the basically the improved drs and that's how it is going to be moving forward right and again it runs every minute earlier it used to run every five minutes for the host utilization now it runs every one minute for the vm happiness or vm workload and accordingly that makes it more more granular level calculation into how it can be moved and then accordingly that's how it works in that okay so that's that's the improved drs now looking at uh, one more feature which came in from the seven was adding of the ptp or uh, it's just like ntp but then more sub millisecond accuracy this is becoming more and more uh, asked by some financial and their scientific application where we are talking about uh, putting on all kind of workloads virtualized in here this becomes an important thing as well so PP, ptp is uh, enabled uh, is available from 7.0 onwards but then it requires the latest vm hardware as well as the vmware tools but then it's all up to you to, to configure that once you meet the uh, meet the requirements okay so that's uh, that's with vsphere i will quickly go into vsan as well as Lars and Reiko mentioned vsan is also key component within the vcf or vmware cloud foundation and that's where we had been enhancing uh, keep, keep, keep kept on enhancing vsan as well along with the vsphere right so what so with we there had been quite a lot of features a lot of features we had been added into vsan 7.1 uh, and then all of those capabilities can be categorized into i could say four of four categories first is basically helping to deliver developer ready infrastructure this is very important as reiko mentioned we a lot of things are going into the tanzu side we are making sure that all the customers who want to move into the cloud native apps we have the platform ready for that not just on the vsphere level but also on the vsan layer right so that's where the vcf comes into picture so i'll talk about the vsan uh, dp dp platform as well as vsan direct platform and then the second thing is the scale without compromise like most of the most of the capabilities had been enhanced it is just not about new features but also enhancing how vsan had been functioning and then operation simplifying the operation that's that's one of the major parts of major parts of vsan operation right so it is just not about deploying vsan but then op, uh, making sure that it works well maintenance or day two operations is one of the most important thing and we had been keeping a lot of focus on that front and a lot of things have changed on or improved on that as well and then of course extending the file services support for the smb and then the file services within the vsan that that again we have gone into that right so i will touch on very few things on this uh, and then we'll go into the questions okay so we talked about the um, the 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 uh, the de developer the the developer platform right the container workload how do we do that right so uh, in seven update one we introduce a new framework to simplify the deployment and operation of the modern application relying on cloud native architecture right so this is what we call like the the new vsan uh, data persistent platform or dpp so which which actually uh, allows modern databases and stateful services to plug into this framework through APIs to maintain a, an efficient persistent of these distributed applications and that other thing. So it forms as a, it gives you the, uh, the platform to integrate with that. So it allows to run efficiently with optimal performance while enabling the administrator also to perform their day-to-day -day operation so that's that makes the uh, this goes into the tc optimized storage for stateful apps as well as vsphere management vsphere side also it makes it a lot more important thing now the next thing what, what came out what we want to talk about the new feature is the vsan direct configuration right so so it provides the optimized data storage for shared nothing app sna app like Cassandra and MongoDB that do not need data services, right? So it's available as part of the vSAN DPP as well. So it again helps in like adding the uh, more, make, making sure that the cloud native apps are, uh, the vSAN is the best platform for the cloud native apps, both from the developer side as well as from the, uh, the uh, from the uh, from the vSphere admin side. Now, these are being consumed uh, through the, vsan ready node vsan ready nodes are being we are uh, coming up with a lot of vsan ready nodes in which these are getting updated and then com uh, com uh, compatible on that front as well 
Now, one of the key things, this is very important uh, as I see with different customers is like the Slack space. So we are talking about uh, imp really improved efficiency through the effective capacity management. So if you look at the earlier, uh, uh, the release before, even till 7.0, we used to uh, reserve uh, quite a lot of free capacity for vSAN, what we call Slack space, at least like 30%. So 30% was huge amount when it comes into small environments or even, even in big environment, when we talk about 30%, that is huge, right? So we have optimized on that and which means if you look at the uh, slide in a 24 node cluster we have brought it down to near, nearly to 14 percent and also it we have we have given the capability of like uh, configuring that so so this reserve ca capacity actually includes the host rebuild reserve which is for the failures and then for operational reserve which is basically for the operational task so now you have an option now to configure that Right. So if you don't configure that, that is not being considered at all. But then once you configure, you have an option. Or you can enable the operation reserve. You can enable the host table reserve, and then take it, and it can go in and in, into that. Right. So that's that's where it has become more more effective, more cost effective, and giving customers the ability to configure or utilize that to the maximum. Now the other thing, what I what what is the key thing which has come out into this is basically like improvement performance improvement we are talking about like 30 percent performance improvement with 6.7 update from 6.7 update 3 so which is on 7 update 1 right so that is based on basically like a lot of things had been changed like on the cpu optimization doing the improved parallelization and then the faster resync operation this is very very important basically on on the front that when when a delta write happened when we are done now doing only delta writes into the uh, when a host moves into the maintenance mode we are doing only the delta write not the whole thing so that makes it more faster as well a lot of enhancements that been done in the network and uh, network side as well which makes it uh, all adding on to this uh, this 30 percent improvement right now uh, last mentioned about the vsphere lifecycle manager this is a very key capability which I will take about a thing about in vSender just because it helps you to maintain the lifecycle of the whole VMware infrastructure. It's not about vSphere, but also about NSX, vSAN and all. So for vSAN, now we have this capability of adding the vendor plugin into the, the vSphere lifecycle manager. And Lenovo ReadyNode is already there. We are, uh, other hardware vendors are also coming out with that. But then as of now, Lenovo ReadyNode is available uh, for specific nodes. And then it when you do the, uh, the upgrade or update through lifecycle manager, now it is aware of uh, the vSAN fault domains, stretch clusters, and all of those things. This was this is a major challenge when when it comes to upgrading vSAN when when you have a stretch cluster or fault domains all of those things administrator should be aware and he should go through specific step manually to make sure that the upgrade is uh, successful or upgrade is foolproof right so VL, vlcm or lifecycle manager can take care of it by itself so that is the biggest uh, thumbs up for all of from for the vSphere admins or vSAN admins as I can see. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's with the updates at what I can talk about, and then just to the uh, just to sh show you the vSphere current version 6.0. You know, the it has been end of support. Technical guidance is available till 2022, uh, but then of course there is no direct support available now. 6.5, we have support till 15 November 15, 2021. And then 6.7 extended to 50, October 15, 2022. But then, yeah, vSphere 7 is all with uh, with future feature packed release. So, and if you want to have the Tanzu to run on that, definitely yes, vSphere 7 update one is the uh, folk, uh, target where you should go into. You have we have talked about quite a lot of things. Still, there are a lot of information which are available uh, publicly as well. So you can go into core.vmware.com where you will get to see, get to know, get to get the details of all these vSphere, vSAN, vCF, all of those things, all the all the information what you want to know of these products. You can go into core.vmware.com and you can get all of those details in there. More information, these are the links. We can we will share these with you. Uh, anything on vSphere 7, vSAN, all of those things are available in these links. You can can basically go into that. And with that, 
that's i will close on open for questions